hope you enjoyed the lunch. And uh, now we will proceed with our sessions. Uh, you know, I'm very happy to present, <laughs> to introduce you to Mr. Phil Pinkhardigan, who will uh, give us a speech about, well, he will explain what his speech is about. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Joseph. I'll try and speak slowly. Um, I mean, to start with, I think Joseph initially introduced me as the bravest man in London for coming to, to Russia or to Kostroma. I actually think the Russians who are standing up here giving presentations in English are the bravest people here, not me. Um, and to, to Joseph's point about why the uh, the day is being held in English. Let's just say if it was in Russian, <laughs> I wouldn't be standing here. So uh, I'm, I'm personally glad it is in English. But um, I think you all know I'm from the London Stock Exchange. I was, I was thinking I knew um, most of you because I was here at the last conference in October, but I, I, I would say there's at least twice as many people now. So it's uh, quite incredible to see how fast the company is growing. Um, so for those of you that know me, hello again. For those of you that don't, just to quickly say what I do. So I, <coughs> I'm the uh, technology product manager for the, for the London Stock Exchange. So I look after the turquoise market, which is a, a competitor to the, to the London market for equities. Um, and I also look after the UK market. Both, both markets are now running on Millennium IT, which is the, the vendor that is owned by the exchange group. And I'm really responsible for all the, all the functional development on those platforms, um, covering, capturing requirements, actually building the software, working with mostly with Millennium, and then working with our test partners to, to, to test and put it into production. And then, to <coughs> so moving on to what I was going to talk about today, so based on the topic of the, of the conference, I thought you might be interested to hear a bit about how we view performance and latency from a point of view of, of the UK equity market in London and also turquoise. <clears throat> so this is what I was going to cover. So I thought I'd spend time on you know, what low latency, uh, well, some of the aspects of low latency, what we're measuring, how, I mean, we, we, we're quite proud that today we, we believe we have the fastest equity market in the world. Um, Certainly in Europe, it's debatable whether it is in the world. Um, but should it be faster? So we can talk about that. Who really cares about the low latency? Um, if you can't get low latency, what's the next best thing? And then just, uh, just discuss some of the technology that's got us to where we are today and where I think maybe we're going to be going in the future. <clears throat> and then finally, I was going to just spend some time talking about just general performance and capacity management and how, in the London Stock Exchange, we, we manage the platform so that we're confident that it can cope as, as volumes grow. So, first of all, just what we're measuring. So, there are really three distinct things that we measure. There are actually lots more, but these are the ones we really care about and the ones that we, we spend a lot of time worrying about. <coughs> and the way we measure them is quite important. So um, obviously, being an exchange, we, could, we only really control our own environment. We don't control how people connect to us. So we only really measure the latencies within our environment. So it's measured from the starting point is just outside the firewall to the point at which a client would connect to us. Um, obviously, it excludes the transmission time to and from our venue, which will vary by client. Obviously, it excludes the latency of the client's own systems. And this last one is an important point. We only learned this after we went live. Um, some of our, when we first went live, our latency measurements looked really bad on some occasions. And when we investigated, we found that some clients actually couldn't keep up with our system and were unable to process the messages that we were sending them. And they were causing very low level network packet retransmissions. So when the, when, the way we were capturing the data, we were actually recording the retransmission time along with the latency, so we were giving false figures. 
So we exclude any, uh, any client that is a slow consumer, we exclude their data from our measurements. In fact, that's not strictly true. We do capture it and we can identify it and then we can talk to those clients. So here are the three things. So order latency, which is um, often referred to as order to act, and it's the time taken from an order arriving just outside our firewall to the acknowledgement going back. And that could be, and it, it could be a new order, it could be an amendment, or it could be a cancellation. We measure all of them, but it's, it's the round trip time. And secondly, we measure the market data latency. So order latency is a personal thing. It's, you know, when you send an order, you get um, a message back to you alone telling you that we've acknowledged it. The market data is public broadcast data. So when orders enter our platform, we will broadcast to the whole world, well, to the members who are listening, uh, data about that order. And there, we, we, which is a common um, way of doing things, is we measure the time from the act that went back to the originator to the time that the market data is broadcast to the public. And that's referred to as act to tick. Now those two we publish, you know, we measure them internally, but we also publish those. If you look on, on the LSE and the Turquoise websites, they're, they're both there, those figures. This third one is, is, is just as important to us, but is not really something we publish as such. This is specific to Turquoise, and it's for our dark pool, or dark book, where orders come in and they match at a reference price, and that reference price is currently the primary market, so a UK security in turquoise matching in the dark book, whenever we have a cross, it would cross at the price that's currently happening on the main exchange, as it happens, the London Stock Exchange. But we also trade French securities, and there we would use the price that is currently on the Euronext exchange. So we, we care a lot about the, the, the latency of us processing those prices, because if it was large, then our, the quality of our executions would be poor. So, so they're the three things, so hopefully you understand those. I've got questions at the end, but do feel free to stop me if you wish. <laughs> Hello, I am from your competitive site, my six. <laughs> so the question is that there is a third component of latency probably, the time it takes to report a trade for your order staying in the order book. Do you measure it? Um, well, well that's, that's really a function of that we, we do measure the internal matching engine latency, but I mean, the, uh, the order book is, is not really a, there's no physical order book, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's memory inside the matching engine, so um, we, I would say we don't explicitly measure it, but we do measure internal matching engine latency, which, which um, we record the, the length of time it takes for the matching engine to process a transaction, and we have all that data but we don't publish that. But obviously it's lower than the latency of the order to act or act to tick because you know, the, the order acknowledgement and the tick that's coming off the back of an act are the result of an order book update. So whatever those figures are, you know, obviously the internal figure is lower. But we don't explicitly measure that. Um, okay. I mean, what most people think of as an order book is a, is a screen showing you the book, but no, generally no, that, no, that's... The question is, uh, uh, the, consider the following scenario. Uh, uh, a client uh, sends an order and this order stays in, in, in the matching engine. And then another order hits this one. How long does it take for the client to get execution report uh, with trade after this uh, Aggressive order comes. Well, that's, that's included in our order latency because if you, so when, I, when we measure order latency, that's all order types, whether passive or aggressive. They're all put together into one pool. So, um, and we can, break, we can break that down in, you know, by, by order type if we, if we wish. The figure we publish on the website is a blend of everything. So if an aggressor um, sends an order to our book, um, the acknowledgement will only come back after they've had a match. So the time, the latency that we're publishing includes that time to, 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 to do the match. So obviously, if we, if we can claim that we have a certain average, then that means that not only passive orders, but also aggressive orders will, will execute within that time. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Okay. So, so with those three attributes, we, we really concentrate on two metrics that we care about. There are actually many others we measure, but these are the, the, the key ones. The first is the average, which is very simple. You don't have to be, I mean, I'm not a mathematician, so I can understand these figures, but it's just the mathematical mean. You just add them all up and divide by the, the number. Um, and the second one is the consistency. So we, we refer to this as the max 99.9. .9. And what this means is quite simply, you discard the worst 0.1% of your orders or the latencies and you take the maximum value of those that, rem that remain. So it gives you a feel for, you know, if I was to send a thousand orders to this platform, you would expect 999 of them to be at that value or better. In fact, you'd expect them to be on average, be the average. But um, you wouldn't expect, you'd only expect one order out of a thousand to be worse than the max 99.9. .9. And then <coughs> the systems we, we measure on, so on production systems for both Turquoise and the LSC, we're continuously measuring. Every single message gets measured. So it's not just, we don't just sample, we capture every single message every day and we store it in a database. And we use that for not only for um, the values we publish on our website, but also for us to, to examine if we have any issues. And then this last point, which I guess is quite topical, is, is obviously on our QA systems. So we really care about these three metrics, and these, sorry, these two metrics on the three attributes. Um, and what that means is whenever we have a new software release, we will evaluate them on the new software. So initially we'll do it on on a QA environment, what we call pre-production, and then we will actually also do it on the production system itself uh, on a weekend at some point prior to the, to the release. And what we're, what we're looking for there is, the most important thing is that we haven't had any regressions in the, in the latency due to some you know, side effect of something that's changed. Um, sometimes we might expect a regression if we've done something that we know is going to introduce latency, in which case we'd just be looking to confirm that. Sometimes, in fact quite frequently, we'll make changes that are intended to improve latency, in which case we'll be looking for evidence of that. So it's very important that we test um, these, these attributes and the, using the metrics. So this is a, a, a real example, this is real data. So this is, um, this is taken from Turquoise. I took this from I think it was Tuesday, last Tuesday, I took it from. Um, so this shows you the order to act latency that we currently achieve on our production system in Turquoise. So you can see the average is 108 microseconds and the max 99.9 .9 is 381 microseconds. You know, we do capture, we are able to quote the figures in a variety of ways. You know, we can have the average 99.9, .9, the the max 99, there's a variety of ways, but the two key ones are the average 100, that one there, and the max 99.9. .9. It's, it's quite a nice distribution graph. You can see how closely um, distributed our order flow is, and it is, you know, it is pretty consistent, low latency. There are very few outliers. So, so you can see how fast, sorry, you want me to go back to that one? Hello. I think this chart answers uh, Grigori's um, question. So we have distribution that consists of superposition of several processes and the last the last spike in Poisson distribution it represents fields so it is I would say plus 10 microseconds yeah. this peak is oh. for aggressive orders that are filling yeah yes so plus 13 microseconds for the fields and I would say this one is passive order cancellations <laughs> which yes. would be the fastest yeah and the, probably the one to the right. 
well, I'm not sure which way around they are, but one will be order amendments and one will be um, order cancellations and one will be order um, new order singles. Yeah. In fact, we do have the data. We could have, I could have broken that down. We do actually store the data at that level. But this, this is just a, a high level. Okay, so, I mean, we've got this super fast platform. I mean, 100 microseconds is pretty damn quick. Um, is it fast enough? So it's, it's a question that people often ask. Um, so we have actually asked our customers. We, we, you know, we spend a lot of time talking to customers about things like this. Um, and the feedback we've received when we talk to our customers is that actually we are fast enough when you look at the average. Um, our customers believe that the average, averages we achieve are um, brilliant. They, they, they confirm that it is the fastest platform. But what they do tell us is that they'd like us to improve the max 99.9. .9. They'd like more consistency. Um, this is particularly true of algorithmic trading, um, high frequency traders, where they're often you know, arbitraging and relying on very small, um, very small profit on very you know, um, minuscule time scales. And it can mean the difference between making a profit and not if that you know, one order in a thousand is slow. So, so, <clears throat> so we've taken that on board. Um, I think we always knew that. We, we, we always realised that consistency was important. Um, and our focus has been on, on, since the deployment, and if you look at, I mean, I was looking back at, I haven't got the graphs, but I can tell you the, the figures. Um, so we have improved our, our average has improved by about 30% since we went live on both platforms. But our consistency has improved by 90%. So if you look back at the consistency when we first went live, compared to what it is today, it is, it is much, much improved. Um, also, I mean, the, the multicast data, we had a specific issue um, where we found that our system was too fast for our own client connections. So uh, we, we use a, a brand name, Extranex, for the client connections to the exchange. And we used a um, 100 megabyte line, and that couldn't cope with the broadcast data speeds so we had to artificially slow the data down until we could upgrade all our clients to one gigabyte lines. We completed that about, um, I think it must be a year ago now, and we were able to then turn the speed up on, on our broadcast data. But we do continue to focus on, our main focus now is, is getting better consistency. We'd like to get lower than 380 microseconds. You know, the, the closer to the average we can get that, the better. Now, I mean, these are my thoughts at the bottom, not, not necessarily those of the exchange, but um, I mean, if you look at the predecessor systems for both Turqu Turquoise had a Sonova platform and the LSE was on a, a system called Tradelect. And both of those systems had latencies around one or two milliseconds. Um, now, in those days, that time was very significant because the latency I mean, it obviously depends where the client is, but I think typically a round trip latency might be a quarter to a half a millisecond to and from the exchange, um, depending on the line and the distance. Um, and if you've then got a three, uh, uh, sorry, a two millisecond latency on the exchange itself, that represents, you know, that's the biggest piece. Um, but now we're in a situation where our latency is so small, it's, you know, it's tiny, it's a fraction of a millisecond, that it's no longer so important to customers. I mean, if we were to improve, you know, if, if we were to make a 10% improvement in our latency, I think for a typical client, they'd probably only see, from their point of view, a 1% improvement because the transmission time is now much more important than, you know, the time we spend. Which is why I think customers are saying to us that the average is not so important anymore. Um, <clears throat> and I think Co-location customers, so I don't know if everybody is aware, but you know, members of an exchange are, um, they have an option to purchase space in the um, exchange's own data centre. Uh, it's open to all members, but they have to pay for it. And we call them co-located clients. 
and the guys that really are late to synthesis are all there. If you go into our machine room, you'll see all these machines, you know, all, the, all the different high frequency firms. So they, they are the guys that really care about latency. Um, and just uh, the last point is I was just, I was doing some research because I was curious to know what the human reaction time was and I found it on Google. So it's apparently 200 millis milliseconds, roughly. Maybe some people are quicker. But if you compare that to our latency, you know, our, our latency is a very, very, very small fraction. So if you have got a manual trader reacting to something, on a screen, I don't think our latency, because our latency is now so low, I don't think it really would make much difference if we improved it by, say, 10%. Yeah, just so who, who needs low latency? I think I've already sort of touched on this, but I think the least sensitive are, you know, the manual traders, the, the guys that are working orders manually. Um, the most sensitive are people like arbitrage traders, portfolio traders market makers, high frequency traders. So the, these guys here are the ones that are in the machine room co-located. So these ones are the, are the people that really care. Um, but also you have to look at it from our point of view as the venue. So we also care about the latency. Um, I mean the main thing for turquoise, um, I think it's probably more important for turquoise than the LSE, is that um, Within Europe, they quote something called the EBBO, which is the European Best Bid and Offer. And um, your own venue is measured against how, how often you're within the EBBO. So the faster the market data, the faster your updates appear on clients, and the more often you will appear within the EBBO. So, and I've mentioned before the quality of the dark book. Um, but the last two points are important, I think. You know, the fact that we have the fastest trading platform in Europe, possibly the world, you know, gives us immense kudos and it's a really good marketing tool, even if it may not be that important to everybody. So, if you can't have latency, what's the next best thing? Um, so, as I said, I think consistency. So, if, if you can't afford a colo platform, you know, if you haven't got the money to buy a space and air machine room, um, I still think the most important thing, far more important than the average, is the consistency. So even if, you're, even if you're relatively slow, if you can build consistency into your systems and your network and your own application, um, I think you would, you would gain more than by trying to get you know, a few microseconds on the actual average. And then I just wanted to make the point that resilience, I mean, maybe I should have made this bigger, but it's, it's, it's no good having the fastest trading platform in the world if it falls over every five minutes because you won't get very far. So resilience is actually underpinning everything. So um, I think that's probably the most important thing. So a quick look at the technology. How, we, how did we get where we are? So, um, so Millennium is C++ binaries. I mean, a lot of the predecessors used, used languages that um, were interpreted and had garbage collection, um, which caused outliers. C++ is, avoids a lot of that, which is why it's so fast. Linux, InfiniBand is one of the main reasons why we are so fast. It's a fiber optic network that connects our, our machines together. Um, we have a, a bespoke native protocol, um, also itch. And I mentioned before the one gigabyte extranex. Obviously customers are using fiber optics, co-location, a lot of the high frequency traders, the algo traders, are using FPGA in our machine room on their boxes. You can see, if you look down into what next for Millennium, we're not currently using FPGA ourselves, but we are planning to. So that's coming. But you know, we're looking to rebalance things better. We, you know, we think we can balance instruments across the matching engines better. We can, we can balance instruments across our market data better to get better latency. We can add more partitions. We're looking at adding more threads to our existing partitions. Um, we've got a, a new product coming out called the Ticker Plant, which I could spend an hour talking about, but I won't. Um, and there are other things going on, but obviously the last two points are important. We, Millennium, have a very strong R&D function, and they spend a lot of time looking at new technologies, and they will be, they, they are watching our competitors. So. We're the fastest now, but if someone were to come out with some technology that takes them 
you know, much beyond where we are. Although clients don't care, I think we would want to react to that. Right, so, we're right, so we've, we've done with latency. Um, I just thought I'd just, I've only got a couple of slides on this. Um, but just to, to let you know how we deal with just managing our system, um, I'm sure you're all aware that back in August we had a, a huge spike in, in volumes. Um, now our platform actually um, coped very well. We didn't have any problems with our trading system, but it did take us beyond where we'd ever expected to go. And it, and it made us take a step back and, and, and question how we manage the system what levels we test it to and what levels we expect it to be able to go to. And what we came up with was um, these, what we call KPIs, or key performance indicators. Um, so that we do measure lots of other things, but these are the key ones. I won't go through them all. Um, but the key point is that we, we, we decided that we would build into our system a headroom. And the headroom we require is that we, we can cope with a maximum of either four times the average or twice the peak. So if you take the top one, total daily transactions, so we, we, we are always calculating a running average, so we know the average number of daily transactions we have on each platform, and we record the peaks. So whatever our biggest peak is, so for on turquoise, that, um, we, we've peaked at 40, um, oh, sorry, 120 million transactions in one day, that was our biggest ever day. So therefore, our system has to cope with twice that peak, which is 240 million, so that's what we test to and that goes down through the chain. So that, that's our approach. So it's effectively a twice peak headroom, or four times the average, and those two figures are roughly about the same, um, but occasionally one is slightly higher. And that's how we manage it, and we monitor it, and we review it regularly. And then, so this just explains how we do that, which those of you that work on turquoise testing, technical testing will be quite familiar with this. Um, so we prove those KPI levels. We, we also take the system beyond those levels because we like to know what happens when it does explode because every system has a limit at some point. And we like to know what that, well, not only what it is, but what happens when you hit it. Um, so we, we do it on pre-prod initially, then we go into production. These, these golden rules are very important to us. So. The first one is that no matter what's happening in the market, we expect the system to always respond to our customers. So they will always get an acknowledgement or, or some kind of response, um, even if we've taken the system beyond the boundaries, beyond the, you know, the max two times, four times. And then secondly, that any component that does fail, because as I said, every component has a point that it will just give up, um, it must do so gracefully. It must shut itself down in, a, in a, an orderly manner and always obey rule number one. So, and that's what we look for. And then, obviously, with our knowledge of what the bottlenecks are, so although we may, you know, today we have headroom for all of those um, KPIs, and as it grows, we will start to approach limits. And as long as we know what those limits are, we can do something about them before, before we reach them. This, this um, I've just got one graph here just to show you how things do change over time. This is the, the lit or the integrated the main um, turquoise book. This is the matching engine transactions per second over time since um, I think this starts from when we went live on Millennium. Yeah, pretty much. So you can see, um, I think this is August last year when we had the, the, the peaks I was talking about. But in fact, since then, it's been, it's been pretty much volatile ever since. So our, our KPIs have grown over, over that period, and we have reacted. So for example, we added another partition to the lip book. So you'll be pleased to know that I've nearly finished. <laughs> so I thought I'd just summarize what I'd said so that it sinks in, and you... Uh, Hopefully you remember. So the first thing is what we're measuring. So it's order to act, act to tick, and the reference price latency. They're the three things we really care about. Are we fast enough? Yeah, we think we're there on the average. Um, our customers tell us we are. 
but we need to focus more on the consistency. We want to get that better, closer to the average. I mean, who really needs it? It's the, it's the high frequency traders, the algorithmic traders that, that really care. The people who are physically in the machine room, because for them, the latency of transmission is not in the picture. Therefore, if we improve by 10%, they will see a 10% improvement. What's the next best thing? Consistency and resilience. They're, they're, you know, in fact, I would say resilience is the most important thing. Um, I won't go through the technology again. You can read that. And then, just to reiterate on the performance and capacity, you know, we've, we've identified these nine K KPIs. We have a, a formula for calculating the headroom, which is twice the peak, four times the average. We track all of those. And then when we're testing, we always test them to those limits and we're looking for those two golden rules, which is always respond to a client and always fail gracefully and always obey rule number one in all circumstances. So hopefully I didn't speak too quickly, but I was getting told I was running out of time. So. <laughs> Hi. Um uh, the, the, the question, you mentioned that customers are now pre pretty much uh, okay with the latency you provided to, me, to them, I mean, the average latency, but looking in the midterm, uh, what do you think, are, are we exhausted in what we can do with latency, and if, if not, and do you think there's going to be a strong demand in the future to improve that, and where do you see the capabilities for that, like uh, marshalling messages, um, Matching engine, middleware or hardware, what, 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 what do you think were like the capabilities here? Um, okay, so there's a few answers to that. <clears throat> so first of all, on the current generation of the Millennium platform, from discussions with the, the guys that own the product, they believe they can get another 30% um, improvement in the latency through things that they already have ideas for. Um, so we expect we, we will improve probably over the next 12 months. We'll get that latency down to maybe 70 microseconds, approaching 70, uh, 70 or 80. Um, <coughs> they are also, I mentioned the ticker plant, so that 70 or 80 percent will apply to the order to act latency. Um, so I mentioned earlier the ticker plant, so we're, we're, we are working on a product which is going to go live um, the initial phase will go live the end of this year. And what that is, is we're, we're using FPGA to process the, the market data through a ticker plant. And that is going to significantly lower the latency of the, the broadcast data um, by an order of magnitude. So, so our broadcast data is going to become lightning fast. And that's, that's happening. That's what we're working on now. In fact, Exactro are doing the testing for it. Um, <clears throat> they've actually had to, I mean, this is quite funny, they've actually had to slow it down in the architecture because the way they were originally going to do it, the public broadcast message would have come out before the private acknowledgement. So they've had to make a change so that doesn't happen because they didn't think that would be acceptable <laughs> for everyone else to know about your field before you did. Um, so, so that's happening. Um, also, Millennium are currently... Um, thinking about and designing what they call Generation 8, which is the next generation of the, of the Millennium platform. So we're currently on Generation 7. Um, I believe, I don't think there really is a fixed time frame, but they're, they're thinking about it this year. They're going to build it next year, and we'll probably go live the year after that, I would think. So maybe two or three years from now. And they're telling us that that is going to be an order of magnitude faster than the current generation. So I don't know, maybe you know, below 10 microseconds for the order to act. Um, now I suspect they'll be using FPGA more frequently. Um, they're talking about things like using the, I mentioned the fiber optic InfiniBand that we currently use to communicate between our own servers. There's talk of actually using an InfiniBand link to the, to the clients that are located in the Colo data center. So they would have an InfiniBand connection. There's also talk about using um, a lower level API for people to connect. 
So currently we use native, which is fast, but it, there are even faster ways. And we've had discussions and some clients are interested in, in doing that. So having this what they call Serendib, which is the internal API of Millennium. So using Serendib over a, an InfiniBand line, we think would dramatically reduce the latency. But going back to my you know, earlier point, I think consistency is actually more important. So, but it is going to get much faster. Hi. Um, Hi. I, I'm Lydia Sinitsina from Exact Pro Systems. Uh, the question I have is going so faster, and you already mentioned there are slow consumers, which I know from experience may create problems also for you, like memory leaks and gateways and stuff. So do you think you are, you are uh, going to basically outcast them? So, I mean, uh, they, they will say like, we, you will have to say like, uh, we, we either have to create a separate gateway for you or something like that. Uh, that's uh, my question number one. And the question number two, what you have just mentioned about using different API, which is actually your internal API. Aren't you afraid that if you introduce some customers, even if those are just uh, a very lo lo low number of customers, which are your best customers, and you give them the API, which is the internal API of your system, you kind of uh, 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 sec do a security breach? They, they yeah, them, yeah, well. I forgot what your first question is. Now. The Sorry. first ask, question is this. about outcasting uh, slow customers. Okay, right. Like so the first one is, um, so we already have that problem. I, I think for a, an order, sending in an order and getting, getting an acknowledgement, I don't think it matters if the system is fast and it, it won't cause you a problem unless you, you try and send in more orders than your own system can, can deal with and that's under your control. So we don't have a problem there. For the broadcast data, we do have a problem today. So some customers just cannot deal with the fast broadcast data. So on the LSE, we actually have a two-tier broadcast system, They're what they call prime itch and itch. So they actually today have two, two broadcast data systems, one of which is running in the old slow method, which people who are not latency sensitive and cannot deal with that fast data can use, and the other one that, that the high frequency traders use. So we already have that. Um, regarding the, the API, you're absolutely right. And that's one of the um, things that we would have to do to the API. It would have to become secure. We'd have to have a way of making sure that they could not do anything untoward. Um, so currently that, that interface doesn't have that level of security. And that's something that would have to be done. And I think similar with the InfiniBand as well. I think there are some issues there with the InfiniBand, again, to do with the security. OK, thank you very much. I've run out of time, so I don't know whether I can carry on. I've been shown a zero minute card. We still, we still have a latency round table afterwards, okay. so it is okay to press it with the subject. Uh, Daniel Baburin, Arca Technologies. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, during all this latency measurement, you're uh, talking and publishing uh, maximum and average. Why uh, you're not telling us minimum numbers? What is the minimum? Uh, a cheap one. That's a good question, I guess. Um, we see from the distribution, yeah, I don't know why we don't do that. Um, I guess because there are, it, it's also an outlier. The minimum is a very low outlier, therefore statistically unlikely to get them. But um, yeah, it's a good question, I'm not sure. No one's ever asked us to publish that. Okay. And the next one is, uh, what is the real capacity of the system? Uh, not achieved one that you showed us on the graph, like 25, 45 uh, transactions per second, but capacity that you can handle for hours, for okay. example, without increasing uh, of average latency. Okay. Um, I think I can answer that one. So it is 150 at least. Yeah. So, well, it's, it's slightly complicated to answer because there are several components and there are some component limits and there's also an overall system limit. For a whole system. So the whole system will currently blow up um, if you go, if you put more than 440 million transactions through it in one day, that's the current limit that we have. One of the components will fail, um, and that's way, way above our twice peak. If you recall, we did 120 million was our peak 
twice that is 240. The true ceiling is 440, so we're well away from that. If you look at transactions per second, so we, our system is, well, both Turquoise and the LSE have three partitions each. Each partition is, is rated by Millennium at, 20, at sustained 25,000 transactions per second. We've actually proven that it really can sustain 40,000 per second. Um, what we mean by that is you could run all day at 40,000 and it will not blow up. Um, you start to see latency when you get towards 40,000. You start to see more outliers. As Joseph says, we've actually proven that um, it can cope with up to about 150,000 TPS um, for a couple of seconds um, without any problem at all. And that's just one partition. So if you multiply that by three, you know, we can cope with a one to two seconds of um, 450,000 transactions per second, which is way, way above anything we've ever seen in production. You know, the peak we've ever seen on Turquoise Litbook is 40,000 in one second. That's the biggest ever. So twice that is 80,000. We can deal with 150,000. So we're just on one partition. And that peak was actually across two partitions. So, but there are other limits as well. I mean, there are limits in the total number of trades. Um, you know, and we're aware of all of these things and we make sure that we are always well above that twice headroom. And then we watch trends and as we start to approach any known limit, we'll do something about it. One more question. Uh, some, time ago, some time ago, it was considered that uh, the institutions like exchanges should uh, look at uh, commercially available hardware just to be sure that it will, that the, uh, the hardware will not disappear at once and that it is, it is, it is always available for replacement. Now we are talking about implementation of uh, such uh, solutions like FPGA and so on at the exchange level. Do you think it is a safe approach? Um, it's not really my area, to be honest, because I don't really deal with the infrastructure, but I guess it's a good question. I mean, at the moment, the, the processes we use are fairly... Um, it, I don't think it really matters whether we're using IBM or Hitachi or whatever. Um, because we're using Linux and C++, you could pretty much, you know, if our current hardware supplier, we currently use um, Xeon processors. If, if, if for some reason they were to become defunct, I don't think it would be too hard to change. Um, well, I'm not familiar with the precise provider of the FPGA cards that we've chosen, but I, I'm guessing we would be much more closely bound to those particular cards. And if we were to have a problem, then, yeah, I'm sure they would that would become a, an issue. But, you know, I'm sure they could deal with it and, and I'm sure that they would take care not to choose a small supplier who was likely to go, you know, to disappear. Um, the, the guys at the exchange, I mean, I, I just deal with development, really, software development, um, functionality. There is another team that looks after the actual infrastructure and they are always looking to make deals with big companies, reliable companies, the sorts of companies where you can uh, make good financial arrangements as well. But there again, they're not averse to taking risks as well because, you know, InfiniBand, for example, is quite obscure and not really used very widely. And, you know, we've, we've used that. So, so I guess they're not averse to taking risks, but those risks are definitely there for things like FPGA and InfiniBand. Well, you should, um, next conference, you should invite someone from the operations team. <laughs> we could talk more about infrastructure and things like that. <laughs>